Hello everyone, Nemec here. Welcome to my 5.0 Shadowbringers Summoner Review. Summoner has had an interesting history as one of the older jobs that has changed a fair amount with each expansion release. Moving forwards into Shadowbringers, Summoner was one of three jobs that underwent a considerable series of adjustments. Now while Square Enix mentioned that it was a partial rework, I believe that statement really undersells the extent of the changes done. At the base level, the job is still about casting your spells, using your off-global cooldowns, keeping dots up and pets. However, the new changes have had a significant impact on the overall job feel and pacing. Having finished the main story quest and spent time farming the dungeons and extremes, overall I find that the level 80 Shadowbringers release summoner is a mixed bag to play. Many of the recent concerns players have expressed have had merits, especially with how busy the job feels. However, it is not all doom and gloom and certainly is not as bad as the 4.0 Stormblood release summoner. Some aspects feel great, while some problem areas that I will get into could be a lot better with some tweaks. I do feel that there are several skills and design decisions in the rework that do not carry over well from previous iterations, making it inherently more difficult for players to adjust to the changes. Newer players and ones less familiar with the job are in for a bit of a rude awakening. Let's begin with my initial thoughts as a career summoner main since A Realm Reborn. Starting the expansion at level 70, the first thing I noticed and felt was the lack of Aetherflow and only having two Aetherflow stacks to gain and use. Aetherflow is now replaced with Energy Drain, a skill we previously tried to use as little as possible because it was the weakest DPS option, and its AoE counterpart, Energy Siphon, both on a 30 second cooldown. The stacks when used no longer generate Aether Trail for trances and are purely used for damage. Energy Drain and Siphon being so frequent is interesting, but carries with them a significant limitation in only being able to be used on an active target to get your stacks. That makes it awkward during prolonged periods of downtime, where you are forced to hold and potentially lose uses over time, something that I experienced while leveling during slower dungeon pulls. Energy Siphon also feels like unnecessary button bloat for not much of a gain versus Energy Drain and could definitely be an area for consolidation. It is, however, fun having more Festers and Pain Flares to play with, going up from 3 to 4 a minute. However, this begs the question of why were Aetherflow stacks not placed on the new charge system with a 15 second cooldown and shared max charges of 2 for the same net effect of 4 stacks a minute. This is but the first area of rigidity encountered among many, which leads to the next topic to cover, trances. Dreadworm Trance being divorced from Aetherflow is a massive change, as it means we are no longer tied to generating Aether Trail from Aetherflow stacks. However, we ended up exchanging one 60 second cooldown for another. Unlike with Aetherflow, where you could bank the resources to use later, there is a tangible lack of flexibility with the usage of this new iteration of trances that feels like a considerable step back compared to the past. This is due to the fact that upon entering trance, your timer is ticking away and cannot be reserved for later, acting as a potential source of job stress. If the cooldowns align with prolonged downtime, we either must choose between holding and causing drift, similar to energy drain's problem, or we keep the time and waste part or a whole trance timer doing nothing. In that scenario, it's lose-lose, while in full uptime fights it will be fine. Encounter design will dictate how severely this problem is going to be felt. As a prime example, previously we had flexibility in handling UCOB trios, whereas now the problem can come up frequently. An aspect I do very much enjoy with trances are the global reduction of 2.5 seconds to all GCD spell casts. This is welcome, as it now applies to our AoE GCD outburst and resurrection. The latter is an especially powerful change as it means we have windows where we are more likely to resolve hard cast races while mechanics are going off. With the strict cooldown timer and instant GCDs, Dreadworm Trans is now used first GCD in our openers to kick things off. We are wanting to use 6 instant ruin 3s to weave our abilities with, in order to set the scene for our rotation. Then we end it with Death Lair. 
This marks a change versus the Stormblood opener, where we cut the opening trance very short in order to use Aetherflow as soon as possible. Dreadworm Trance, however, had its timer reduced from 16 seconds as it was in Stormblood, back down to 15 seconds as it was in Heaven's Ward. This can make executing that window feel a lot tighter, especially if weaving causes clipping, risking death flare cancels. As a player with high ping, I would prefer having that extra second of leeway back, although as a compromise, players can consider having more spell speed for a slightly faster GCD. Dreadworm trances later in the rotation, however, do get cut shorter to rush Bahamut's in order to maintain alignment with buff windows, unless it would be better for us to delay him for adds. This cutting short is also partly due to the fact that Dreadworm Trance no longer provides us with a 10% damage bonus to magic attacks. It is strange in that we now do the opposite to what we did in Stormblood where before we had a short trance opener into full trances later on in a fight, and now we start with a full trance and cut the later ones short. Moving on, at level 72 we gain the ability to use Firebird Trance, a 20 second trance window instead of 15. When a Demi Bahamut summon is complete, it grants us Demi Phoenix Aether, replacing our Dreadworm Trance with Firebird Trance. This is important, as they both share a cooldown with one another, which is why we still have a 2 minute cycle. When activated, it replaces Ruin 3 with Fountain of Fire, and Outburst with Brand of Purgatory. In this trance, we're doing a 1-2 punch combo with Fountain into Brand. This sequencing can feel strange, and can take a bit of getting used to, as Outburst is not a spell we use for single target. I know very early on I'd sometimes cast two fountains in a row out of habit from how often we use Ruin 3 in Dreadbone Trance. Initially, when considering the initial potencies and how it worked, I was pretty skeptical about how it would perform, but with the potency tweaks on release and having played with it extensively, I have to say that Firebird Trance feels pretty damn good. Brand of Purgatory, in particular, has satisfying audiovisuals while also feeling like a powerful action. Prior to level 80, due to Phoenix not manifesting and replacing our Eggies, this trance window feels pretty nice for weaving Eggie assaults, although at 80 that all changes. More on that in a bit. Both trances still retain their tri disaster reset, which brings us to the next topic Dots and GCDs. In Shadowbringers, our Dots and Direct Damage GCDs have been brought together in an unprecedented way, in a term that we've dubbed Fester Ruins. Ruin GCDs and Shadowbringers are back to form with our staple Ruin 3 being back to 200 potency before Ruination, with a caveat. Now before Heavensward nostalgia takes over, it is important to note that all Ruin GCDs have a weaker base value than they had in Stormblood. In Shadowbringers, they now increase in damage depending on whether we have one or both dots active on a target. On paper this was an exciting change, GCDs with decent damage for Summoner again but in practice they come with some glaring design faults. Relating to the prior point of tri-disaster resets when using trances, due to the strict trance timings and the nature and sequencing of tri-disaster applications, there will end up being a somewhat unavoidable gap when adhering to the three tri-disaster one hardcast dot set rule for the two minute cycle. This gap can increase depending on how much previous dot applications have been clipped early. Now a small gap may not necessarily be a problem for dot ticks due to their three second nature, However, it's possible to not only lose ticks, but also risk one or more Ruin GCDs landing on a target without any dots present, resulting in further potency losses of 80, 100, or 140, each depending on which Ruin GCD is used. The dot cycle also has us use Tri Disaster before Firebird Trance, leading to a 20 second window of Ruination being wasted as neither Fountain of Fire nor Brand of Purgatory are increased by Ruination's plus 20 potency. This also has led to confusion among players who frequently ask if Ruination buffs those actions. Further relating to the matter of inevitable potency losses are two other problems that we can experience fairly often. The first is one that happens in dungeon content, our opener, and any other instanced raids with ad spawns. Any fresh mobs will not have any dots on them, making our Ruin GCDs hit for half of their intended damage. This results in us wanting to apply dots first before casting Ruin GCDs. In a dungeon scenario, this could be with Hardcast Miasma 3 and Bio 3 before spreading with Bane, or using Tri Disaster with Bane to also spread Ruination for outbursts. However, due to how big the difference is in Ruin GCD potency with versus without dots, it's actually more correct to either hard clip a Tri Disaster after a pre pull cast Ruin 3, 
or to just try disaster first and wait for the statuses to resolve before using a Ruin 2 or Ruin 4. Cluster Ruins mean that clipping and delaying RGCDs in these kind of scenarios can be correct because the potency loss from doing so is easily offset by the potency gain from the following GCDs hitting harder. As a result, it is a part of our standard openers despite feeling like a play error. Doing this gains us 100 potency on the initial Ruin 2 at a cost of a minor delay. The second problem is where our dots cannot take hold on a target. This is more likely to occur in content with many players present, be it 24 mans, big fates, hunts, or large scale instance content such as Eureka's NMs, LDC and Arsenal, and Diadem. Due to there being a hard debuff limit on a given enemy entity, with enough players present, these debuff slots all get filled quickly, which results in other dots simply not taking hold. Not only does this mean that we're lacking a chunk of damage from dot ticks, with the weaker Festers and Ruin GCDs we're losing over 40% of our regular damage potential. This to me is a fundamentally broken design, as jobs, including Bard, shouldn't be so penalised in their output just because many others are present. Fester Ruins are high on my list for things that I would like to see adjusted, or perhaps removed entirely in favour of GCDs that do not rely on dots for full potential. Notably, our strongest Ruin GCD, Ruin 4, feels very weak to use in that scenario. Ruin 4s are also no longer RNG procs from pets, which brings us to the next topic. Eggies, Eggie Assaults, and Ruin 4. Eggies have undergone considerable design changes with the Shadowbringers release. The first big change is that pets now can no longer be harmed and that all of their enmity from damage goes directly to us. This means that we can now place pets right beside a boss without starting an encounter, and that pets can no longer die to cleaves, but it also means that pets can no longer tank for us. The next big change is that our eggies now have more clearly defined roles, and to facilitate that, summons are now instant OGCDs on a shared 10 second cooldown as a 5.0. Where before we had to do some meta knowledge math to figure out which eggy out of Ifrit and Garuda were the correct choice for personal and raid DPS, now it is much simpler. Ifrit Eggy is for single target damage, Garuda Eggy is for AoE, 2 plus targets as a 5.0, and Titan Eggy is for survival. The final big change is the removal of the pet actions on the pet bar in favour of the two new command abilities Eggy Assault 1 and Eggy Assault 2. Eggy Assaults, or EAs, are like in Kindle in that they are commands to tell the Eggy to perform a specific action. They are now on the new charge system, and cap out at 2 charges max with a 30 second cooldown to regain a charge. As such, we have 2 uses of each EA per minute, for 4 EAs a minute total. This is important, as at level 62 and level 74, we now have traits where on successfully executing an EA that does damage, we are now granted a stack of Further Ruin. Further Ruin is no longer a 15% RNG proc on any pet action, and now lasts indefinitely, stacking up to 4 times. Before level 74, we can only generate 2 Ruin 4s a minute, while once we hit level 74 we can generate 4. Due to this limited number at level 80, all uses are planned out for our general rotation, although if we need to move far enough it is still better to Ruin 4 for uptime. In the media tour build, the RNG trait for Ruin 4 procs was still present, and as such I was looking forward to a playstyle of stacking Ruin 4 procs with guaranteed ones from EAs. Ifrit Eggy retains Crimson Cyclone and Flaming Crush, which are still single target and AoE respectively. Cyclone has lost its stun component, so there's no more stunning adds like an A3S. Garuda Eggy retains Aerial Slash while gaining a new ground AoE called Slipstream. Due to being a ground AoE from Garuda, if she is swapped for any other pet, be it an Eggy or Demi Summon, Slipstream's Evergale Circle will despawn, so keep that in mind for AoE sustain. Titan Eggy retains Mountain Buster for AoE, and now has Earthen Armor for personal mitigation. Earthen Armor is pretty exciting, as we have never had such a strong personal shield to use defensively, meaning in clutch scenarios and in progression, it can mean the difference between life or death. Unfortunately, it does not generate Ruin 4s when used, hence the prior emphasis on EAs that do damage. In cases where prolonged downtime lasts 30 seconds or more, a timely earthen armor could be used more freely for safety without costing an overall ruin for an EA charge. EAs overall are a lot of busy work for what doesn't feel particularly rewarding. For what is an enforced plus 4 OGCD weaves per minute to the busiest caster, the damage they produce over a fight amounts to a low single digit percent amount of our total. 
The ruined fours we gain from them are often used in order to gain them again, making them feel like a case of revolving doors. It was mentioned in an interview with Yoshida that EAs make summoner feel like a summoner, but I disagree due to their impact and the fact that unlike past expansions with pet actions, you cannot use Eggy Assaults while hardcasting. Rouse has also been removed, meaning that we have no way to further buff their spells and enkindles. Talking about enkindles, praise Bahama in that they finally changed the enhanced enkindle trait by removing the RNG cooldown reduction in favour of enkindle now being at a fixed 2 minutes. But with the aforementioned removal of Rouse, eggy enkindles are the weakest they have ever been. Now they do around the same damage as 3 Ruination buffed Outburst GCDs, or about 240 to 280 summoner potency per target, which for a 2 minute cooldown feels very anemic. I sure do miss the days of Ralph's Spurring Kindles, and I wonder if Square Enix may one day reconsider adjusting the potency of the action to make it have some semblance of its former glory. So what does this mean in practice for Eggies? Ifrit is brought out for most boss encounters and any singular tanky trash mob, However, in Shadowbringers, his potency has taken a considerable hit, with Burning Strike now being 80 Ifrit potency, down from 135, and his no longer having his 60 potency attack auto either. When compared to how he was at the end of Stormblood, this results in an overall 60% damage loss from Ifrit barely making him a gain over Garuda, in single target, to the point that a good amount of luck on Garuda's RNG can make her seem to do more damage. This is another point of confusion among players when deciding which Eggy to use. Overall, we can now find Ifrit doing about 7-8% of our total damage, with his EAs and Inferno being lucky to exceed 2 and 1% respectively. Garuda is brought out for trash packs and ad phases and actually feels more impactful despite her reduced potencies. Windblade at 40 Garuda potency per target is around 84% of Ifrit's Burning Strike, which is why using her on two targets or more is a game. She does however retain her tendency to linger behind during dungeon pulls, which can make her prone to despawning from becoming too far out of range. Titan in typical situations is rarely to be seen. Damage output wise he is strictly inferior to Ifrit. But with Ifrit not being as significant of a contribution to our total damage, the loss with using Titan isn't as severe. Erlen armor has me keen to try him out earlier on while progging, especially for harder encounters while lacking in gear. He has definitely saved me a few times in other content. Enough about Eggies, now it's onto the real pets. Demi Summons Demi Bahamut was our magnum opus capstone ability in Stormblood, which changed things up with his 20 second window of us sequencing our spells and abilities to achieve 11 real worm waves and 2 Akmorn rotations. In Shadowbringers, Demi summons will only perform their core action in reaction to us completing a GCD cast, which means no more having to use Addle or Tri Disaster to proc one. As a result with a typical GCD, our goal is now 8 real worm waves and 2 Akmorns, where we will hardcast 4 ruin 3s. Hardcasting more during Bahamut windows feels strange given all the instant GCDs that we had to use before. The timings between worm waves when doing so feel too long and slow, as if Bahamut is falling asleep on the job and is waking up from us poking him. It is quite different a pacing with worm waves being so far apart instead of 1.5 second bursts. Our Dragon Lord and Saviour retains his separation anxiety due to his default steady state, which can still compromise worm wave totals. However, with Enkindle Bahamut now having a 10 second cooldown, we should never really be leaving Akmorns until the very end of his timer to result in ghosts. With the hard casts during Bahamut, he has become even more of a turreting phase where we just want to stand still. However, if we must move, the same principle that we advised in the past still applies. Movement is fine for worm waves, but do not force a Bahamut move check before or while trying to resolve Arc Morns. Shadowbringers introduces our new capstone ability with Demi Phoenix being summoned when we activate Firebird Trance once we hit level 80. On being summoned, Phoenix casts Everlasting Flight, a party wide heal over time. Previously, with the Mediator footage, we saw the potency in heal ticks and were not impressed. 20 caster potency per tick for 6 to 7 ticks was weak, and so was the result. However, on release, Everlasting Flight became a 100 caster pet potency heal, and in practice is appreciable. 
In 8-man content, my Statics White Mage is always happy to see when Summoner Medica 2 is out, especially when it aligns right after a raid-wide AoE has hit the party, allowing for more focus on other duties while regens heal everyone up. I've previously talked about Firebird Trance feeling nice with the 20 second windows of instant strong GCDs, but how is Phoenix? Honestly, Phoenix is a clone of Bahamut with fire actions instead of unaspected, with the same stats and calculations. As a summoner familiar with the numbers, it is painfully apparent and slightly disappointing. This means that like Bahamut, Phoenix also only reacts to GCDs for Scarlet Flames, his equivalent to Worm Waves. Revelation is Fire Akmorn, but due to Fountain and Brand being instant, Scarlet Flames are front-loaded. This also means that our sequencing for achieving 8 Scarlet Flames and 2 Revelations is slightly different to Bahamut's sequencing. Phoenix also has the same separation anxiety problem, which can compromise a Scarlet Flame or Revelation if not careful with movement. When talking about Firebird Trance, I mentioned that at 80 the flexibility in being able to use EAs changes. This is because, while Phoenix is out, no Eggy is present in order to use them, and it can feel like a step backwards in toolkit cohesion. Both Demi summons have a delay after being summoned where they will not recognize any inputs before they start reacting, which is not how Bahamut worked at all in Stormblood. While this had been accepted as a bug on the Japanese official forums, it has since been moved to working as intended. Hmm, I do wonder about that Square Enix. Due to not being the first Demi summoned, and also preferring Bahamut as a summon in general, I wasn't wowed by Phoenix as many other players were. I've often heard people commenting on Phoenix feeling better of the two summons, but I am fairly sure that this comes from Firebird Trance happening in tandem, rather than Phoenix himself. If we had to use a Ruin GCD sequence for Phoenix, they would feel and execute the same. That all said, I am very much a fan of Demi summons and think they are a positive direction for the job, while I have felt for a long time that Eggies are the weakest aspect, holding us back in design despite being gradually weakened every expansion. If they were to one day go, I would not be sad. Now that was a lot to discuss. On to the closing segment, 80 Summoner as a whole, with 5.05 .05 patch notes. At the start I mentioned that playing the job was a mixed bag. There are elements I love and elements I loathe, both from a design and from a practicality perspective. My main gripe and concern is that similarly to 4.0, the job can feel disproportionate in terms of how much effort is required for the resultant damage, which to some can be off-putting to players and disincline them from playing Summoner. The job in full uptime is now over 40 casts per minute, right after Ninja, Machinist, then Bard, whereas previously it was much closer to mid-30s like Red Mage. This has led to some players making complaints about the number of inputs affecting their hands while playing Summoner, while finding it more tiring after prolonged fights. Even the world prog race for Eden Gate Savage, world second clearer Pen Pen swapped to Black Maid from Summoner, not just for DPS reasons, but for the fact that playing Summoner for all previous fights was flaring up his tendonitis and causing him pain. Black Mage by comparison has considerably lower casts per minute, and can put less strain on hands in this manner. Unsurprisingly, the forced Obey Eggy play has not been received well as a whole as many enjoyed the less intense pacing with Sick Eggy play, only the Shadowbringers iteration is worse than Obey ever had been due to all the commands being OGCDs requiring them to be weaved with instants instead of being able to be used while hardcasting. The many weaves can feel bad if players are prone to clipping due to higher ping, something I know all too well. Though do note that more double weaves are not a reason to start single weaving everything as a high ping player. Please don't do that, you'll make Bahamut sad. The anti-synergy within the job, such as Firebird Trance GCDs not being buffed by Ruination while the dot cycle requires a tri disaster there, has led to confusion as to how the job gels. Things like having to delay our first Firebird Trance for full uptime alignment, and requiring hard clips like the one in the opener, or triple weaves if using triple weave demi summon methods, will not necessarily be apparent to the general player. The lack of natural intuition and rotation growth versus other jobs on release again reflects how things were in 4.0, which can lead to the feeling of the effort required in learning and executing the job to not be worth it. Now that 5.05's patch notes have been released, alas, none of the changes addressed any of our core concerns, which is disheartening to me, but then again, we were not expecting significant changes with 5.05, but for 5.10 instead. 
You can read more in my 5.05 news post on Act Morning in the description below. What does this mean for Summoner moving on for Eden Gate Savage and beyond? The job's in a weakened state when compared to the feel of the other casters, but in the hands of a proficient player, it's still a solid option for personal and raid DPS. It was present in the world first Titan Savage clear, and after all, job effectiveness will vary depending on player skill. We are still able to race for progression, with faster base cast times if necessary in trances. We retain our on-demand mobility with Ruin 2, but the job retains its initial lack of cohesion. We're not as bad as 4.0, yet it's not much better in feel and fun factor. I am happy to see more people playing the job, but I am sad for the people having to experience yet another rough release state instead of Summoner feeling more like a dream to play from early on. It's a job well known for its early expansion teething problems ever since Heavensward. I do have hope, as Square Enix does listen eventually. If we end up with a series of changes down the line akin to 4.1's patch, I know I would be pleased. I am sticking it through because no matter what, I'll always love the job, and by playing it, it'll help me provide better feedback for the future. On that note, it's time to draw this review to a close and resume work on job materials for actmorning.com and the balance. Some of ours you can find in the description below to help you. Thank you for tuning in, and have a good act morning.